Our speaker of today will be Han and Marco from Human XR. Both of them have very su substantial experience in the medical technology industry. And the topic they're presenting will be virtual reality for physical and mental activation. So before we start, just a brief introduction. So Human XR is the developer of the extended reality software, and they have developed a product named New Horizons. It allows the user to cycle around a virtual reality world. So as we all know, Fourier has a series of product named Cycle Motors. So as part of the collaboration between Fourier and Human XR, we integrate the Cycle Motors series of product with New Horizons. So this allows the direct translation of user, uh, user cycling speed into the virtual world. I would also like to play a video from Human XR so that the audience here will have a better understanding on what Human XR do and what technology they can offer. Right, so without further ado, please welcome Han and Marco. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So let me first say that I'm very excited to, together with Marco to, to present today. We're very happy with the strategic partnership we have with you uh, to see how together we can help people in fast rehabilitation and help the life of those who need it most, as we say. so. Our passions have always been very close, although the technology has been very complementary. And I think that sort of makes this a very strong and interesting uh, strategic partnership. So what I will do, I will um, uh, give a little bit of background on why we started Human XR, uh, what the product is about and how you can position it, because it's a very innovative product. I mean, VR has been uh, around for a long time. Uh, now, but the adoption of VR in, in clinics is still something that is uh, uh, um, having a lot of research uh, being put into this worldwide. Uh, and we're very eager to share with you our feel and impression of where we stand today, including where we stand with our product and how that is uh, adopted in, uh, in the part of the world where we are. So uh, I will start with that. And then um, Marco, my colleague, will uh, focus a bit more on the design choices we have made and also a bit of the technology behind uh, to give you a flavor of uh, what what is important when you make these kind of products. So I will share my screen. Let's see how that works. There you go. Share. So, as you can see, making exercise fun again, that basically is summarizing a lot of what, what has been driving us in this whole um, adventure, because we have seen uh, from very close by, my, my wife is a physiotherapist, worked a lot in rehab clinics, that um, uh, exercise is very crucial, uh, not only for rehab, but also for, for helping manage chronic diseases. But a lot of people don't like to exercise. It's painful. It confronts them with their limitations. So just the simple thing of how could we make exercise and rehab more fun again is what has been driving us. So we want to do this because ultimately we want to stimulate physical and mental activation. So let me... Um, uh, just repeat, and I'm sure that, that all of you in the audience are familiar with that, but exercise is important for many aspects when it comes to, um, to health, and not only for rehab, but also for cardiovascular um, uh, 
condition uh, to, to help blood pressure, to improve muscular fitness, to improve also um, the risk of falling because your muscles get stronger. So there are a lot of reasons why exercise is important. And this is something that you specifically see as we get older and we all get older. And you see here that people um, more, that are, let's say, above uh, 60 years, most of them, more than half, have physical limitations, which means for many of them, it's not so obvious to do traditional physical exercises. And if we grow older, you see that only 14% 14, 14 of people between 65 and 74 does exercise. And the older we get, the less we do exercise. And it's actually striking to see that the World Health Organization is reporting that 3.2 million deaths per year can really be attributed to insufficient physical activity. So I think the whole um, um, drive that we have here together with our partner to see how can we stimulate um, uh, exercise in the context of rehabilitation, but also in a broader context is, is a very relevant social topic that we feel very happy to contribute to. So we did a bit of research when we started to see, okay, but why then is this typical group of patients not so motivated to do exercise? Because when, you know, when you're young, you want to go hike in the mountains and be, be active and, and sit on your racing bike. So then it's a passion to do sports and be active. But what you see here is that typically there is lack of motivation. Very strong reported in, in literature, lack of motivation is really the number one reason why people don't feel like exercising. It feels heavy, it's too tired. Uh, people don't know where to go, uh, don't like to exercise in a group. Also, when they have limitations, it can be a bit embarrassing. Sometimes don't like to go outside. So then what we did, we asked a group of um, physiotherapists, rehab specialists, uh, psychologists, about, okay, what would then be the ideal situation that would make exercise more interesting? Because that would help us to design the virtual worlds accordingly. Again, with the whole idea in mind, how can we make exercise more fun again? So um, the, the feedback was very clear that it needs to be engaging and encouraging, obviously. But also we got a lot of feedback that uh, being in nature, being outside is something that people always really um, uh, um, welcome. Uh, the, the, it should be bright, colorful, playful, maybe with a touch of magic. Um, ease of use is important, but also audio um, is very important. So we use all that input about four years ago before we started designing New Horizons to understand what were the design criteria, right? So what we then did um, to, to create New Horizons, we basically um, had four pillars that we have been focusing on to achieve this. So New Horizons, what, what is it? It is a virtual reality uh, platform that is designed so you as a user feel you are in this virtual world, you are somewhere else, and you can exercise in that world. In the real world, you are using a treadmill, you are using a floor bike, you're using the, the, the beautiful devices that we've now integrated with Fourier Intelligence. Uh, but in the virtual world, you feel you're, you're somewhere else. You're, um, you can do the same types of motion with your legs or with your hands uh, to progress forward in this virtual world. And this platform, this virtual reality platform, we call New Horizons. So what are four important aspects of New Horizons? First is we really wanted to, that it feels immersive. It means to, to really make sure that you feel like you're in a different place. And why is that important? Um, it's first of all important because it triggers the same neurological processes like being in the real world. And there has been also enough literature to show that exactly the same parts of the brain are activated in virtual reality. If you, for example, make a walk in a virtual forest, than if you make a walk in a real forest. So even on a, on a, on a functional brain level, you, you trigger the same responses. But in order to do that, we also have been working with technology that um, allows to see stereoscopic. So you really see depth in the world that we created to, to, to really um, strengthen this perception of immersiveness. The second point is intuition. Um, of course, it is not easy to make this advanced technology very easy to use. However, what we have done, we have done it such that there is no um, need to use a keyboard or press any buttons. 
So the way that we want people to use our uh, virtual world, to interact in the virtual world, is just by pointing or using your head to look at certain uh, uh, panels to activate things. So we want to make it very simple. Um, and the, the third element is interactivity. And interactivity is important because it also gives you a sense of control. So what you see here is that many of the people that we're targeting, they have lost a certain degree of control in their life. They cannot walk so easily or they are struggling to move their, uh, to use their arms. So basically what you see is that it's important to give this sense of freedom back and therefore interactivity is important. So we wanted um, to build it such that you are in control of where you go and the path you choose in this virtual world. And the last point is intelligence. Um, uh, for example, uh, how you, and maybe Mark will say a bit more about it later, but how you take the, the handles and how you position them is automatically being adjusted to, uh, to where you naturally make the, the movement. So these are, let's say, four important uh, aspects that we have used to create new horizons. So where do you then position this kind of virtual reality technology? So what you see here on the left um, axis, the, the, the vertical axis, is the degree of immersion. So this is the degree to which you feel you are somewhere else. And this means that also um, a, a, a high immersion uh, helps you to be, to be distracted more from pain, uh, whereas when you're not uh, immersive, it's more like watching television. And on the uh, horizontal axis, you see the degree of interactivity. So you, you all know, okay, you can sit on a bike and watch television, right? That's what we have done many years. But then whatever you do on your bike, it has no influence on what you see on the screen. So there's no interactivity at all. And it's also not immersive because you're still very much aware that you are in a room watching television. Now, then you all remember this, we, and that has also seen some adoption in, in, in rehab clinics because it was a very elegant way to make people interact with the screen. And that already was a step forward. But I think what is interesting that meanwhile, the virtual reality technology was also developing. So here you go already from the screen to this cardboard solution that Jake talked about that you tried with your uncle, I think, a long time ago. Uh, but now I think we can benefit from the fact that the technology has become much further and is still advancing as we speak, which means that basically you can uh, both advance in the interaction, so the motion interaction can really be fine-tuned using the controllers that are um, uh, provided with this hardware, and you can benefit from the interactivity. So that's where we position our technology. We want to leverage the immersiveness Sorry, I think I have to switch off my phone because somebody is. Okay. So um, basically what you see is we want to benefit from the fact that both the immersiveness and their interactivity now can be um, uh, at the level where it, it starts to be very interesting for use in the, um, uh, yeah, for, for elderly uh, population or for rehabilitation. It's interesting that in the current solution that we have, we also allow people to use it on a TV. So you can basically switch off the virtual reality headset and then you get immediately the same experience on a TV. So you can seamlessly integrate VR with a view on the TV when that is desired. So the main message here is Human XR wants to make exercise fun again by leveraging the immersiveness and the interactivity that is provided by the latest technology in VR. That's where we position ourselves. So then what we didn't talk about yet is, and that's what I will do before I give the words to, to Marco, is about the, the, the effects on, on the population, effects on humans of using the VR. So there are basically three pillars here. So first of all, you see that virtual reality helps cognitive stimulation, so it triggers the brain because you think you're somewhere else, the same brain functions are being used. It also can help physical exercise. And it has been proven that it has a very strong effect on pain distraction. So um, let me just give you a, a few um, uh, hints of what is uh, described in literature because there is a long and a growing body of literature around the use of VR 
in, uh, in rehab and in the clinical context. And uh, I think um, we can share with you after the, the, the seminar a list of this literature uh, uh, so you can look in, in it for yourself. But a few striking things I just wanted to share is, first of all, pain. So there is many studies being done on the fact that VR helps distraction from pain. Even meta studies that prove that the clinical effect is as strong as pain medication in some patient groups. And the best way to explain it is very simple because if you were playing football when you were a kid and you were so much engaged in the game and you would fall and hurt your knee, you would probably only notice it after the football match. And that is just because you are very much distracted from that pain. And that is what VR does as well. So a very strong immersive experience helps to distract from pain. And therefore, we also have been emphasizing on making this immersiveness very strong. Then, uh, of course, it can help to train legs and arms because you can use the controllers, the, 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 the Bluetooth uh, controllers that we have, the integration that we have built with the, with the free intelligence equipment. Uh, and there is a lot of um, uh, literature already since a long time, uh, starting 2012, about the positive impact of exergaming, so exercise and gaming combined in, uh, in, a, in a large cohort of people, including uh, elderly. And one of the reasons for that is because it is basically a sort of a carrot. You know, it, it makes you go the extra mile. When you are on your virtual, uh, in your virtual world and you want to go somewhere, you're curious, you want to discover things, before you know you have cycled a longer distance than when you would have if you were not in this virtual world. So virtual reality does help to push people, patients to extend their capability just a bit further than what they would normally do. And also there, there is quite some literature um, uh, that we can um, find. Another aspect that I think is really interesting that I found also personally intriguing is that in virtual reality, you can do more than you think. And this is still something where a lot of research is uh, on its way. So I think this is still early stage. But for example, if you have a frozen shoulder and you lift your arm, you know after, after many years living with a frozen shoulder that it starts to hurt from a certain angle. But if you are in virtual reality, you don't see your arm. So then it seems that you can lift your arm higher because you don't see where your arm is. So you can basically fool your brain to think beyond the pain. And this is really an intriguing aspect that I think also in the future will be much more further developed. And as said, we are in this adventure together and we are not pretending to be the clinicians here, but it's just interesting aspects that I wanted to share with you. And also um, I, I found it interesting to say that um, uh, for example, if you train cognitive function in a labyrinth where you have to find your way, you can easily measure with functional MRI which parts of the brain you use. And in a virtual world, you use exactly the same parts of the, that brain. So for people with stroke, um, uh, sometimes it can be more safe to train in a virtual world than in the real world. Uh, and since it's a very functional training, I think uh, there is still a lot to come in this domain um, where we can bring this technology to this uh, group of patients to help them get better. Another aspect um, is physical exercise in combination with cognitive exercise. So um, there is, um, it's known that if you do physical exercise whilst you are doing cognitive exercise at the same time, it's much more functional. So if you want to train certain brain functions while you're also using your body, the effect is larger. And that is what we do in this way, because if you put somebody on a very advanced um, uh, bike, and meanwhile you have this person do certain things in the virtual world, you are training both the body and the mind at the same time. So simultaneous cognitive and physical training. And then finally, and it also has to do with, let's say, um, uh, helping your brain believe that you can do it. If you can walk in a virtual world, it can help to reduce fear of falling. People feel like, hey, I'm, I'm walking in a virtual world, so probably I don't need to be afraid for walking. And that effect also can be transposed in the real world. So these are a lot of interesting um, uh, findings that we see popping up more and more that clearly shows that this is a, a growing field where I'm sure more applications will be um, will be found and developed for the next years. And we are very happy 
that together with Fourier intelligence, we can embark on this adventure to see how these patients and this uh, population can benefit most from this combination of technology. So for me, in conclusion, before I hand over to Marco, I think with this technology, you can promote healthy aging, help manage chronic uh, conditions, of course, support rehabilitation, and support people with disabilities. So I'll, I'll hand over to Marco now. I'll, I'll stop sharing, Marco, so you can um, take it from here, okay? Thank you. I will take over. Thank you, Han, for the... Unless you wanted to have questions first, Jake. What do you really like? We haven't have any questions coming in yet. Uh, I think it's okay that Marco can continue. Yeah, okay. Then we'll... Um... We'll keep going, and then if there's any question, we'll take it as, as we go. So many thanks, uh, Han, uh, you know, for walking us through I think, the benefits of, of New Horizons. What I would like to do next uh, is um, you know, to share with you uh, a bit of the behind the scenes. So you know, how does New Horizons work? Uh, what, are, what is the technology which is behind it? Which choices we made when we designed it? and uh, um, you know, how it connects back to the technology that we use, uh, which is virtual reality, okay? So New Horizons is um, an interactive platform. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a video, it's not a picture, it's a world that is built real time as you go. And uh, you know, we have more than a million of you know, square meters of world uh, you know, built through. And uh, you know, we have, variations in there so you have six words uh, and each one has you know its own peculiarities like really being in a, in a different scenery and you know, around the, around the world we have a lot of things happening so it's not a static world you know there, there's wind moving the trees there are birds flying around there are balloons in the sky so from a cognitive standpoint it's uh, you know very stimulating um we have people as well because you know human to human interaction is particularly important and stimulating. And if you've seen some of our movies, you know, you have people coming at you and waving at you. And, you know, most of our users, you know, they wave back and basically they interact with them. Uh, you know, we have different location points of interest. We have little, you know, Easter eggs and things that are hidden here and there just to see if you, if you catch them. Um, we give the possibility to the user to choose, you know, whether they want to be on a short trail or on a medium length or on a very long, depending on their condition and depending on their willingness to exercise. And of course, you know, we don't only have cycling and take into account that, you know, New Horizons is designed for a sitting experience because we don't want people, you know, to risk falling, but of course it can be adapted um, you know, to different kinds of experiences. We are saying, okay, how can we adapt it, for example, to walking you know, on a treadmill? That's something we are looking into that. But right now you need to be seated. You can be on a bike or you can be on a chair with a floor bike. Um, and, you know, depending on your capabilities and depending on how you feel, you can, you know, choose what to do. And we try to have an, in, in a sequence of, you know, biking movement involving your leg, but also hand movement which uh, involve your arm, either bare arm or you have to, you know, uh, having your hands is very light controllers and that represent your hand in virtual reality. We also have a, in a virtual coach and you saw it in, in the movie, we have these fox which walks, um, you know, in front of you and also gives you, you know, stimulation to when it comes to the type of exercise, whether your hand motion or, uh, you know, or leg motion is good enough whether you have a good pace, it encourages you, you know, to do more. And also we have, you know, throughout the experience, vitality points, you have things that you have to find and grab, and that gives you more points. And, you know, at the end of the experience, when you get to the finish line, you have people cheering you and, uh, and you know, welcoming you to this new um, goal that you have achieved. Now, virtual reality, uh, you know, needs to be experienced. So, you know, it's very difficult to do it, you know, through a, through a webinar. So we encourage everyone who has, you know, interest in that either, you know, try to experience it from, you know, either your, your kids or a friend or, you know, go to the shopping mall when that is possible and really experience uh, virtual reality by yourself or, you know, get in contact with us or with Fourier and, uh, you know, see if we can organize a demo for you but you really have to try it for yourself. Now, some of the uh, you know, design and functional aspects behind the new horizons, okay? 
uh, when you are in virtual reality, uh, you know, some people might uh, experience discomfort, okay? This discomfort is technically named as cyber sickness, and it's kind of the analogous to seasickness. And I'm also a sailor and, and sea captain, so you know, I can make a parallel between what happens in virtual reality and what happens on a boat. But basically, this is due to you know, what is called ocular vestibular mismatch. So basically, we position ourselves, as you know, in space, um, you know, mainly through three means. Uh, one is you know, our vision. The other one is our vestibular system. The third one is uh, um, you know, through the position of our joints, which we can sense because of muscular spindles. But basically, virtual reality can only stimulate you know, two of them. One, of course, is uh, you know, the, the muscular positioning, but that's indirect. Directly, virtual reality only stimulates vision, okay? So we cannot stimulate the vestibular system. So whenever, for example, you have a rotation or an acceleration, your eyes will tell you, well, this is happening, but your vestibular system doesn't send the same information. And that creates a mismatch. And that mismatch might lead into, to some people uh, into you know, feeling uh, a bit of nausea or a bit of discomfort. So what we have done in the design of virtual reality, and you know, we are lucky enough that Han is one of these people that is very sensitive you know, to uh, ocular vestibular mismatch. So we are using him as a guinea pig and whatever works for him you know, works for most of the population. But basically, you know, you have to, we have to pay attention to one, you know, maintaining the frame rate, meaning that uh, you, know, you don't have any lag if you move your head because the system has to recreate you know, a new angle in the scene. So we don't want that lag to affect you. So that's very important. The other thing is taking you know, uh, rotations into account and linear accelerations into account as well and minimizing their effect. So you wanna have you know, very gradual rotations with you know, very large um, radii of turning radius. Uh, you wanna have uh, you know, very delicate linear accelerations and also you know wisely choosing colors and shapes and sound that helps uh, with maintaining that sense of presence which then avoids also the cyber six of course you know people can get used to it so you know first time you might feel uh, a bit of discomfort and you know third fourth time that goes away but most of our users i would say you know 95 percent they don't have any discomfort when using new horizons Another aspect is, and Han touched upon it, uh, is um, you know not everyone is the same. So not every patient is the same. You know their range of motion, their speed of motion capabilities, their willingness to exercise are different. So what we have built into New Horizon is a form of intelligence, of artificial intelligence, which automatically adapts to the patient. So if someone uh, you know, cannot cycle that fast or if someone has a range of motion which is limited, the system will automatically adapt to it and you can still exercise, okay? Also the possibility you know, to choose between uh, different lengths of path uh, allows you to still achieve your goal even though you're, you're not you know, going the extra mile. Maybe next time then you, know, you can do the short part, next time you, should, you choose the medium one and so on, or the caregivers, you know, stimulates you to go the extra mile and maybe, you know, choose even the long path, okay? Also the fact that we combine cognitive stimulation, you know, with the physical uh, exercise helps people achieve, you know, their goals, um, you know, to greater extent. Also very, very important is, uh, uh, you know, VR is primarily uh, you know, personal experience, a private experience, you know, you are into the, you know, VR headset, you wear it, so that's, that becomes your world, that's what you see. But, you know, in some contexts, for example, you know, we work a lot with elderly patient, patients, uh, you know, there are people around you, and, you know, maybe the exercise lasts for you 20 minutes, but you have a lot of people around you, and, you know, they're going to be next. Now, we project the same experience that the person is living into the VR headset into, you know, on a TV screen, the same TV screen that we can also use in 2D mode. So in non-immersive world, still interactive, but non-immersive in case someone cannot bear, you know, virtual reality, or maybe they're, you know, they don't want to do it. Still, they can exercise there, but the screen is also, uh, you know, helping to project the experience to the other people around, to the bystanders or to the caregiver. 
so that they can see what is happening. They can see how the people are, um, you know, moving in the world or what they're interacting with. And, uh, um, you know, they can also take some indications from that. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, you know, we also told of, um, you know, patients and people who have limitations. Uh, so people who cannot, you know, use their hands or maybe they have limitations there, they can interact with the system with a gaze-based interaction. What that means is that, you know, when you wear a virtual reality headset, we know exactly with the orientation of your head and your eyesight. So we know where you're watching. And then we can use that, uh, you know, line of sight to interact, uh, to make you interact with the world. We also have an automatic mode, which means you can still go through the world and experience, you know, the, 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 the interaction and see the animals and the people cheering at you or whatever, but without really, uh, you know, engaging with it. And we call this auto mode. So it's very good, uh, you know, also as an introductory mode to the experience, but it also works for patients that, you know, have no mobility, so they cannot really interact in that way. Also, uh, you know, the experience can be controlled from the outside by the caregiver using a remote or a keyboard. And basically, if, uh, you know, the user says, oh, you know, I would like, you know, to change world or I would like to maybe go, you know, a bit slower or please put me in auto mode because I'm tired, that can be done directly, uh, you know, from the remote. So the caregiver is part of the experience and can help to control the experience. Uh, last but not least, you know, we have um, a number of devices that have been connected. And of course, we have been working with, uh, with Fourier Intelligence to integrate their uh, devices. You can also, you know, use this little, you know, biking sensor if you already have a bike, which is not equipped with Bluetooth. We do everything via Bluetooth, so there are no wires, you know, laying around. And uh, basically, as soon as, for example, with the Modus H1, as soon as you turn on the bike, the bike connects to the system. And then your pedaling speed is basically used within the system to drive your experience. And it's also shown on the display, you know, how far you're going, how fast you are going and what your rate is, okay? We have room, you know, to integrate more and more devices. And of course, the challenge is, you know, how do you may match the exercising in the VR with the motility that happens on the device and, you know, the kind of movement that, uh, that you are doing. Some future directions, um, you know, we want, uh, and we are working to reduce the footprint on the system. So, you know, of the system with the idea that, uh, you know, you can have the fully fledged system in the hospital or in a rehab center. And that's, uh, you know, is what uh, you will experience there. But then once you are back home, you can use, uh, uh, you know, a mobile VR device, which does not require a computer, which does not require a screen. And potentially we can bring the same exercises, you know, to you, to your home uh, with this uh, mobile and low cost device. With the option that, you know, multiple systems can be interconnected. So exercising can also become a collective experience that can be a bit of, uh, um, you know, competition or even collaboration, depending on the mode. And we're also looking into ways, you know, through the rehab hub, for example, to connect the hospital experience to the home experience and, uh, you know, make a care continuum there. Of course, we're also looking into expanding, you know, the range of motion, the movement, you know, can we do more, uh, for example, with, with the legs? Uh, can we introduce walking, you know, with all the safety that that includes? Uh, um, you know, or other titles, type of, types of movement as well. Also, you know, we have an extensive use of artificial intelligence to make the system more and more adaptable to the users. So, um, you know, there are other uh, additions that we are working on to have the system comply even better with, the, you know, the range of motion capabilities, you know, willingness to exercise. Uh, uh, VR devices are now starting to introduce eye tracking. So, you know, not only we know where your head is pointing, but soon we will also know where, what you're exactly looking at. And that provides, you know, further possibilities to create an interaction and an engagement uh, with, the, with the user, with the patient, which is linked then to compliance and, uh, you know, to the final outcome of your rehabilitation path. 
Also, we support right now seven languages. You know, we're going to add more uh, depending on the on the user and the, of the interest. But you know, our coach, the fox that you see here in the picture, you know, walking ahead of you, can already talk the seven languages, and you know, we'll teach her to to talk more uh, if need be. Okay. Just to give you an idea, uh, you know, before I conclude about. Uh, the power of virtual reality uh, be a short story. I was myself in a rehabilitation center. I worked, you know, many, many years in a, you know, fully fledged rehabilitation hospital. So we had the chance there to work with some patients and I had the patient in particular. So a young person that had a stroke and uh, that affected, you know, half of his body, of course, uh, but he had problems moving his arms. All right. And this person, uh, you know, when he was fully healthy, use it to be a scuba diver. So we thought that, you know, to put this person into a scuba diving experience in virtual reality. And in this scuba diving experience, you know, it, it's like you are holding in your hands, um, you know, one of these devices that, you know, propel you through the water, you know, with, um, you know, with a little engine. And basically you have to point your hands in front of you. And then, you, you know, like you're holding this device and then you have to point it in the direction where you want to go. Now consider that this person had been doing a lot of exercises to, uh, you know, rehab their arms, and the, he had shoulder problems and he had problems with the range of movement. Now, what you know, the caregiver, you know, the, the physician was there, and also the, the rehab therapist noted is that when we had this person try this scuba diving experience, he was so taken by the experience and by the fact that he could experience again, you know, what he used to do in real life. And suddenly it was showing a range of motion with his arms, which was much higher than you know, what he could do in a typical rehabilitation session. So that's you know, what Hannah was pointing out. Uh, uh, you know, it might be in a mental limitation or it might be that the experience is so immersive that basically you forget you know, something else and all your limitations, but you know, that worked. And he realized it himself. So after the experience, he said, I really, I realized that, you know, I was able to do movements that uh, actually I couldn't do, uh, you know, until one hour ago, uh, you know, thanks to the fact that I was enjoying it so much. So I think this story, you know, tells a lot about the power of virtual reality and also, you know, tells a lot about, you know, the motivation of why we do this and why we brought virtual reality, uh, you know, to, to the rehab world and to the physical uh, movement world and you know we are looking to more and more applications of that uh, and you know we're here also to hear from all the users and, and you know and from you uh, you know how we could potentially apply you know virtual reality to uh, yeah, make rehabilitation better with that i would like to thank you very much and uh, yeah if there is any questions or you know open for discussion I'll be happy to get along yeah Right. I'll encourage the crowd or the audience to actively put in your questions, so don't be shy. Uh, if you are shy, then you can put your question actually into anonymous. So uh, we have one question now, so uh, it's pretty direct. Why not use 360 video? Yeah, so I, it, it's a good question. You know what's interesting? We actually started experimenting with 360 video years ago because we, we thought, you know, we want to have these people in a different environment. Let's make 360 video because it's much cheaper and, and simple to do that. But we soon realized that in 360 video, you do not determine where you go, first of all. So you are not in control. Second, you cannot interact with it because the video is taken by the person who recorded the video. So you cannot change anything in the video. And thirdly, a video is not stereoscopic. So you can have 360 video, but you still don't see depth in the video. So, uh, so, so these three reasons made us decide to really choose a different technology. And Marco indeed saw that very early on, a couple of years ago, said so we have to shift to, let's say, gaming technology, because there you can be interactive, you can see depth, and you can make it more immersive, and you are in control of your own destiny. And maybe you know, so to add to that, uh, you know, something that I didn't mention as future direction, you know, a, 3D, a 360 video is predetermined. So you're gonna, you know, video an, an existing world and that's pretty much it. The technology that we are using allows us also to generate potentially, you know, an infinite 
landscape or an infinite world on the fly with infinite variations because that's made by the computer as you go. So think about, uh, you know, you want to be on, you know, in the forest or you want to be, you know, up the mountains, but these mountains, every time they are different, every time, you know, there is something new, every time, uh, you know, you have new animals coming, you know, from new directions. So it gives an infinite amount of possibilities and yeah, limitations of video or pictures. You know, some people are still using, for example, uh, pictures or, you know, they even use Google Maps or, or Google Street View. But yeah, that, that's also, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a, a suboptimal experience in that sense. Okay. Um, so yeah, I've got a personal question to ask all three of you. We also have Niels Wetzels here. Yeah. So he is the CEO of HumanXR. So thank you, Niels, for sparing your time to join us. So we have all three um, from HumanXR. So what is what are your views on VR with haptics? Marco, would you take that question? Yeah, so from a you know, technology standpoint, so... Um, we are seeing, you know, an evolution into the possibilities of, for example, having more and more sensors on the patient, right? So referring to the possibility of, for example, you know, wearing a suit or uh, even stimulating the person, you know, wearing a suit with, for example, uh, you know, skin pressure or with, you know, the possibility to feel the world or even interact with the world, um, you know, with the capability of, uh, uh, for example, grabbing an object and really feeling, you know, whether the object is hard or soft. I mean, this technology is evolving, it's evolving fast. It's mostly driven, you know, by um, consumer experiences and to a certain extent also by, you know, the, the world of cinema and video production because these kinds of suits, for example, are used a lot for, you know, capturing motion for films, uh, you know, and create virtual series. But if you bring that technology to, uh, you know, the world of rehabilitation, that might, you know, give also that extra boost uh, that at the moment we are, we are lacking. So the VR technology at the moment is very basic. You know, you can interact with your hands, uh, and you know, also with your bare hands because the system can recognize you know, hand motion even if you are not using the controller. So that's you know, the next step that is available. But the rest of the body is not receiving any you know, direct stimulation and you know, some of the joints cannot be tracked. Now, if I think for example, you know, Fourier intelligence having the exoskeleton, right? If you see that as a kind of haptic enabled device, Think that you know we could use the information from the exoskeleton in virtual reality, then suddenly you know you can have a full body with full you know range tracking. We can feedback that information you know to the system, and I think bring the experience not one level higher but probably two three level higher, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the best comes always from the combination of technologies. So we're very much looking forward to and you know we we daily keep an eye on what is happening in this world and, you know, finding chances to reuse it into what we do. Right. Um, I also have a question here. So how is the general market uh, acceptance towards the VR technology? Of course, we know that uh, VR has been a quite a new technology in the market. So how, especially in uh, the, all the rehab settings, most of the time we are dealing with uh, elderly population. So how are they accepting the VR technology? Yeah, maybe I can take it. I saw also the question about, um, I think that that's related one. So how do you deal with cyber sickness as old people if encountered it first? So I think what's interesting to notice is that, um, uh, but Niels, you, you tell me if you have different experiences, the, the older people uh, um, in, in the rehab setting, they, we, we hardly ever hear that they have this problem of cyber sickness. And why is that? Because they're also... Uh, less, um, let's say, aggressive in their motion. So if you have somebody who's healthy and very young and looking around all the time and, and going fast and stopping, then per definition, you have much more chance that you confuse your brain than when you go slow because you, you're not capable of going fast. And then also when you, the, the, mo the range of motion with your head per definition is more limited. So we see also with older people typically Yes, they look around and they're really surprised. Like they say, "Whoa, it's 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 
touching to see um, uh, uh, how people react if they, for example, see snow falling. They look up and they say, wow, and they stick their hands out. But it's all small motion. I'm not hearing Han anymore. Yeah, me too. I thought it was me. <laughs> no, okay. it's same here. It's cut off. And Han, I think you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, just to build on that, uh, you know, we we rarely had any feedback about elderly experiencing cyber sickness, and that uh, you know, to us, tells two things. So number one, there are also studies showing that elderly are less prone you know, to experience that problem, as well as very young kids. So, you know, you see very young kids going on a, mer you know, merry-go-round and they like, you know, spin and spin and spin until they fall to the floor. So, uh, you know, they also play with it. Uh, and on the other hand, elderly, you know, they rarely have this, um, you know, also on, on boats, honestly, they rarely have, uh, you know, this kind of symptoms. So there might be, you know, a curve actually where, you know, at the beginning, early in your life, you don't, feel that much, uh, then it goes up and then it comes down again. That will be interesting to investigate. Um, so that, that uh, uh, you know, that's the feedback that we got uh, on, on the particular subject. And it's maybe also important to, to bring up at this point that uh, just because we don't want to run any risks anyway, we have designed our software such that it has lowest chance to invoke that. And certainly we always in our safety briefing explain this experience is designed for you to do this sitting in a chair, for example, right? So, so of course you want to have all the safety precautions in place, just like with any, any rehab equipment that people don't get hurt themselves by using the equipment. So we really care about that aspect as well. Yep. Moving on to the next question. Can you give an insight into the VR headset that you're currently using in your experience? Uh, and I, are you using your own creative technology? That's a tech no, question for Marco. Yeah, the, the, the answer is no. Uh, you know, we have not created you know, the VR technology that we use. We actually use commercial devices and we support uh, you know, a few of them. Uh, you know, primarily we work with Oculus devices. But you also know that Oculus is, uh, you know, part of Facebook, and you know they are pursuing very much the commercial way. So we also use uh, uh, other devices that are more suited for a commercial environment, and actually, also from uh, you know healthy standpoint, they can be better sterilized and cleaned. For example, those from uh, you know Pico, and there are more that we can use. So our technology is agnostic respect to the device that you can use. And of course, it has to be a commercially graded device, and it has to respect, uh, um, you know, the the C marking and, and the hospital environment. The fact that you can clean it is very important now that you know, we are leaving this COVID nineteen emergency. Okay, right. So the next question will be: Hi, great present, uh, great presentation. Could you explain how AI, artificial artificial intelligence, can interfere or change the whole user experience? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, AI in New Horizons is not meant you know, to, to change a user experience or, or interfere with it, but more to uh, follow it and adapt to it. For example, um, I think this was shown very, very briefly in the video that uh, we projected at the, at the very beginning, but uh, you know, when you do hand exercise and you're actually handling you know, the motion controllers, some people you know, are putting their arms higher, some others are putting their arms lower, some people have their hands you know, more spread apart, some people like to keep their hands closer, right? The system is automatically detecting that condition and then it's adapting both you know, the position of the handles in the virtual world, the height and the spread, but also the turning radius, which at the end determines you know, how fast you are going and following those variations along the track. So the AI employment of AI slash machine learning is meant to improve the experience and have the people you know, enjoy it, even though you know, with their own style and with their own you know, limitations or uh, you know, with their own range of motions, for example. So uh, is there, uh, there's a question about how about combining the VR with overground exoskeleton? 
Yeah, I think we touched in a bit upon that, but definitely, you know, we had to start with something and, you know, what we started with, uh, uh, you know, was biking because it's kind of easier and, you know, low uh, entry barriers in that sense. And it allowed us to experiment. Uh, right now, for example, you know, we are looking into walking. We are definitely looking and that's something that, you know, we definitely would love to explore together with, uh, with Fourier intelligence is how can we apply, you know, virtual reality to supplement, for example, the exoskeleton. Other devices as well, you know, a lot of rehabilitation devices, honestly speaking, um, you know, they, they provide the dynamics and, and the kinematics that you need for rehabilitation, but they don't provide the experience around it or a very basic experience. And a lot of studies and our own experience shows that if you can augment, you know, that movement and the dynamics with virtual reality, you have a boost in the outcome of the rehabilitation process. So that's basically what we want to focus on. Yeah. So coming from uh, exoskeleton manufacturers ourselves, Fourier. So we also, I would also like to touch on on this question. So when you when we are looking at lower limb exoskeleton, so uh, one of the limitation we have now is the risk of it because it's lightweight. Patient have to balance themselves in the movement. So when you put a VR headset in it and separate them out from the actual world, you, you are actually creating some risk in it. Uh, they might even uh, be able to fall down and things like that. So uh, definitely we will see this possi um, possible in the future and we will very much like to see this. So definitely because um, bringing the VR in definitely create a different type of a training environment. We can simulate more training environment towards the patient. But the most important thing in the rehab or in the medical industry is the safety of the patient. Yeah. Absolutely. So absolutely. The next um, question yeah, would be- I have a question from Marjana. Um, so does New Horizons have multiple level progressions with respect to the number of repetitions or difficulty? How do we track the progress of a patient? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can t take that. So it's an interesting question because typically when you when you design a game, uh, really a, a, a game for let's say young adults or kids, there is a very strong competitive element in it where you want to progress and compete and make sure you're better than your neighbor or your friend. Uh, we have we have taken a different approach here because um, competition it can also feel harsh if you are struggling in a rehabilitation process and then you are always at the bottom of the list that can really be very demotivating and remember the the whole point of new horizons is how to make exercise fun again so what we did we did build in a lot of encouragement literally along the way so you see people cheering when you reach the finish there is applause uh, um, you 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 can collect extra points by going a longer distance. You can collect extra points by shooting balloons, by finding uh, treasures. But if you don't find these treasures and you don't shoot the balloons, it still feels like I achieved something. So what we did, we have um, at the end of each, let's say, um, journey that you do, you see the amount of distance that you did, the amount of points that you collected, uh, but we have we have on purpose not made a sort of a competitive system in there because we want it to be a rewarding experience, even if you can only go very slow for a short distance and not find any object. So it's a slightly different approach because we don't want to demotivate people, whatever their condition is. So basically you are competing, but with yourself every time. All right. Okay. So uh, we are almost time is up. So coming to the final question. Um, it's also giving all the audience something to expect in the future. So what is the biggest challenges you see that we need to break through now in terms of the VR technology? Because we see a lot of them, uh, the VR in the sci-fi movies. We actually, some, some of, many of us, in, we actually pictures the whole VR experience based on movies. So what we have now in the actual world and how, how different was the gap between the movies and the actual world and what yeah. are we seeing to break through? Uh, that, that's a very good question. And basically, you know, there are a few elements to it. So number one, VR devices right now are pretty, you know, large and kind of heavy, right? Uh, relatively, but, you know, still it's not optimal. Uh, the reason you have this depth and you have this weight of the device is uh, one link to the optics. So you need big lenses because without eye tracking, you don't know where the person is watching. 
And that means that we have to generate, you know, the full range of vision regardless. Now, next generation of the art devices is including eye tracking. The eye tracking allows us to put more pixel where someone is exactly watching. And, you know, the rest will be peripheral vision. So it doesn't have to be as, um, you know, sharp. But what that means is we can reduce the size of the device. We can reduce the lenses and then make the device much, much lighter. The second point is, uh, you know, you need a lot of definition. So the more the experience becomes realistic, the more definition you use. That means, for example, on a standalone device, you need very powerful processors. But streaming technology is coming to VR, also thanks to 5G. So basically, you can have the VR experience being streamed to you. You don't have to generate it on the device. You generate it elsewhere, and then it comes to you. And that opens up in a new world of possibilities where we can have you know, super high frequency experiences, very, very detailed uh, without having uh, you know, the limitations that we have today. All right. OK, I think we are time's up. So thank you, Marco. Thank you, Hannes, of course, new thank for you. your time today. And thank you, all the audience, for joining. So uh, a, re a quick reminder. So the webinar will be held on every second and fourth week of the month. So we will see you guys in two weeks' time. So thank you again, Marco and Han. And thank you audience. for the invitation. Thank you. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Thanks, thank Han, Marco. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.